Hello everyone, welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. This is the Q&A that I have promised that we were going to have before Christmas. So here we are. I hope you can understand me clearly because as you can see my voice is not the best. Before starting with your questions, a couple of announcements. So today we are releasing the Q&A. There will be a short greetings uh, video 24th of December, just before Christmas, just to say Merry Christmas to each one of you. Then the first day of the year, there will be a special. I'm not saying anything. If you want to know beforehand what the special is about, you need to be a patron on Patreon or a subscriber on Subscribestar. Just being a subscriber on YouTube is not enough. Uh, after that, the first video will be the 15th of January uh, because while well, I'm having a break, but we're starting an entire new series in January. And again, I'm not telling you anything. If you want to know before, and I have already explained what you have to do. And while I don't reveal this uh, to small secrets right now, I really, really appreciate if you subscribe, if this is the first time here, I really, really appreciate uh, your subscription to the channel on YouTube because in this way you won't miss anything. Obviously, you need to hit the bell as well. So now, without much further ado, let's start with your questions. Aufenthalt. I'm hoping I'm not butchering your name, but yeah, if this is probably the case, so okay, apologies. So Aufenthalt is saying, I'd like to know more about the Russian doctrine about air-to-air -air missiles usage. I heard that the Russian missiles are intended to be shot in a couple to improve the hit chance. This idea should come from a study which had a conclusion that two old generation missiles have higher hit chance than a single new generation missile. Have you heard about it? So I didn't hear about this specific study. I, I made some research. I wasn't able to uh, locate anything specifically like uh, that. If someone can point me to such a paper, to such a study, definitely happy to, to, to have a look. But the Russian doctrine is something different. Their doctrine is to launch missiles in salvos, not necessarily just couples, in salvos. And among the missiles composing the salvo, there are missiles with different guidance system. The idea is that the evasion strategies for different uh, guidance missiles are actually different. So if you try to evade one of the missiles, it is still possible the other one has a good possibility of actually acquiring and hitting you. In fact, uh, various families of air-to-air -air missiles uh, in Russia have um, different uh, guidance systems uh, actually mounted on the same airframe. Uh, it is pretty much the same thing that the French are doing with the Mika. So potentially a, a Su-35 can launch maybe three missiles all together, one with active radar homing, one with infrared homing, and the other one with a home home jam. And this is the way in which they try to maximize uh, their uh, possibilities, their odds to hit the target. Obviously there are flip side to this. If every time you attack a target, you launch three missiles, well, uh, your ordnance is not going to last long. So basically, even if the, let's say, the flanker family from Sukhoi 27 onward can really transport a um, large number of weapons, at the end of the day, they have two or three salvos. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it really working? We don't know. We never had the opportunity to see how this is going to uh, evolve in a real fighting situation against uh, near peer opponents. Maybe let's hope uh, let's hope we 
stay with the doubt, to be honest. But uh, yes, uh, uh, at a superficial analysis as the one that we can do while we speak, yes, it seems a pretty reasonable idea. Considering that the French basically do the same, well, probably there is some merit in it. So I hope I have answered your question. Bharat Sharma, one of my biggest fans, says would you like to expand on to land naval warfare technologies and strategies? I love your videos on aeronautics and military aviation technologies, by the way. I'm so happy to see that the channel is growing and I have gone through your old videos as well. Good luck, sir. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for calling me sir. You make me feel old, so thank you. So, well, you may have noticed that the channel has been revolving around modern technologies and mostly aerospace for quite a while, since uh, most of the 2019, but there are a number of past videos that are about military history, which I am not abandoning. <coughs> Actually, the cooperation with Military Review uh, was important because it gave me the possibility to uh, publish some historic material while I could keep going with more modern subjects. You may also have noticed that I started a series about World War III some time ago. There were two episodes done and published and then it stopped. There is a reason for that. It is quite an unfortunate reason. The reason is that videos based on a subject like that are very often demonetized by YouTube. So I have done a lot of research, I have prepared a lot of things about that, but until YouTube doesn't change the, its policy and uh, I mean, and there is no possibility to actually monetize the videos that we probably won't uh, go any forward. Now, to answer directly to your question, yes, land technology and naval technology are on the agenda, but it's quite unlikely that it's going to be 2020. 2020 will still be mostly aeronautics, and with some sprinkles of historical, uh, of historical videos. Unless the channel grows quite a lot and I have the possibility to dedicate more time to the channel and to this activity. And by the way, this is mostly up to you. So if you want to see more from me, if you want to if you are curious, if you want to learn more, if you want to, if you, if you like what I do, you have the power to improve the quantity of what I do. Just subscribe, just watch the video, just hit the bell, but mostly please uh, share on your social media, share with everyone who could be interested. This is extremely important for the growth of the channel. So if you want me to grow, well, it's up to you guys. So Bart, I hope I have answered your question and I hope this was the answer you wanted to hear about. Mike Spike is asking, why is the flying wing design not used in military aircraft except for the United States B-2 bomber? It should provide superior heavy lift and personnel capacity. A stealth flying wing seems to me like an ideal way to insert paratroopers for an initial attack. But it seems like no one in the world is developing on this design. Thank you. So I believe that we are going to see more and more flying wing designs in the future because the flying wing design is inherently stealthy 
and the main problem that jeopardized the flying wing design uh, in, uh, in the, till the recent past, let's say till the 80s, roughly, well, it has been basically fixed with the B2. So a true flying wing with no vertical fins of any kind, it is very unstable and critically dynamically unstable. So it does something like this. So obviously it's badly suited for a bomber that has to drop bombs because actually shaking like this uh, does not convey to the precision of the drop. But also it is definitely not the best for a fighter that has to be steady to use uh, the weapons. A plane like the B2 is stable because the fly-by-wire commands, uh, which are basically totally delegated to the avionics, to the flight computer, uh, actually use the ailerons to maintain uh, this longitudinal stability, which is definitely not efficient way because it implies some extra drag. So it is doable, it is working, it has the advantage of stealth, uh, but is not such a good aerodynamic design as you may think because it's true it has a very low drag but it has stability problems. Coming to the second part of your question which is uh, why is not used as a transport vehicle why there are not transport vehicles like that because yeah that could be stealth transport vehicle and potentially very efficient well in this case there are other problems which are sort of common with what happens in the civilian uh, aviation market in the sense that, for example, is very difficult on a stealth design to place doors. Okay, you have a bomb bay and maybe you can drop paratroopers through the bomb bay, but uh, I mean, for a normal transport, it's not really efficient. It's also difficult to place um, windows because the side of the, let's say, what, what remains of the fuselage of the central section of the wing is, uh, well, <laughs> there you have the wings on the side, so there's no place for lateral uh, windows. Now you may have windows up or down but definitely not lateral and the lateral windows are essential for the psychological well-being of the people who are transported the, the people need to be able to look outside you can do a lot of things to overcome this but it's all more complexity it's all extra cost and so on another point is that this kind of design in terms of transport is inherently uh, quite dangerous because you have the fuel which normally is stored inside the wings which is separated by just the wall by, by the, from the cargo compartment so uh, in case of damage you may have some fuel spilling in the cargo compartment which is definitely something that you don't want Definitely on the civilian market, it will never be accepted. In, uh, in the military sector, could be acceptable, but still is an extra vulnerability. Having said that, I am pretty sure we are going to see an increasing number of uh, flying wing designs or flying wing-like designs for fighters, for bombers, and also for unmanned vehicles. Okay, I hope I have answered your question. Simon315 is asking this. Thank you for answering my question. Here is the second question as requested. Okay. The geometry of missile wings varies a lot. The Iris T with the relatively short but wide wings and some of the newer, I think, American designs with very long but extremely thin wings. Is it just because of the point of mass or is this also for extreme maneuverability? And 
are the thin but long wings producing a lift because of the vortex generated or like the other wings because of the deflection? I'm looking forward to the q and I opted for not to subscribe because I don't know if it refers to subscribe star or also YouTube. Um, no, it refers to subscribe star to be honest, but that's fine. So the question here is about lift generation and stability in air-to-air -air missiles. First things first, uh, missiles have a cylindrical body, cylindrical body that is moving in a fluid with an angle of attack, even a small one, actually produces lift. Not much, but produces lift. So a wingless missile is possible. And it also makes sense because if you consider that the missile is small, light, and traveling very, very fast, well, you don't need a lot of lift to make a missile fly. Surely it's not like a plane. The other thing that is important to understand is that missiles don't turn like planes. What planes do is, well, fly horizontal, roll, you vector the lift, start moving like this, then you change the angle of attack and the, the angle of view, you know, just to point the nose of the plane, the direction of the turn. Missiles don't do that. Uh, missiles do a sort of flat turn because the, uh, the actuators, the aerodynamic actuators, just apply a force which is normal to the flight directions. Just deflect the wings and the wings apply a force which is normal. Then the missile itself will tend to adjust to the direction of the flow. Because the missile is supposed to be stable, directionally stable. To guarantee missile stability is that you have fins behind the center of gravity and the aerodynamic center, which is the, um, let's say, the point in which you can imagine that all the aerodynamic forces uh, are applied uh, to the missile. No? This is the reason why pretty much every missile, even wingless designs, like the British Asram, all have fins on the back to guarantee the later, to guarantee, yeah, to guarantee, well, to guarantee the lateral stability and the stability in pitch, okay? Yo and pitch. So now we know that what we really need is a cylindrical body and some fins on the back. Everything else is used to either generate lift or guarantee stabilities or both. So in a missile like the AMRAM, the uh, fins in the central position guarantee produce lift, basically are used mostly to produce lift. In a missile uh, well, that has sort of strakes like uh, wings like the Iris-T that you mentioned in the question, or the French Mika or the, the Aster, which is a surface to air, but that's fine. Those surfaces produce lift and are used for stability as well. Even some American design like the Peregrine or the Standard uh, for yeah, surface to air as well. But they have strakes and I mean, you can assume that the, if the strake is narrow, it's probably there mostly to improve the directional stability. If Drake is a bit larger, like in European designs, it is probably required to produce uh, some lift as well. In the last part of your question, you're asking what is the lift generation mechanism for this kind of strange wings, you know, which, which have the cord which is longer than the wingspan. No? You're saying, is this a non-linear lift with the vortex uh, actually detaching or it is just a normal lift? Neither, because missiles fly a very high Mach number, definitely above Mach 2. Uh, that speed 
there is still a lift production which is due to the fact that the pressure below the wing is superior than the pressure above the wing. The way it forms and the shape of this pressure, uh, yes, it's a quite a long and complicated thing. Maybe interesting for you to go and watch uh, the my video about the hypersonics. I will put a card up here somewhere in which I explain what happens to the lift when you increase the number of the Mach number. When the, these missiles fly at Mach uh, 3, Mach 4, Mach 5, then they have uh, this kind of different uh, lift mechanism. So yes, I suggest you to watch that because it's quite a complicated subject. But I hope I have given a sort of a primer, a sort of an idea, but this is actually a good idea for, um, for making a video, for making a full video describing all the details about this. So thank you very much for the question. Richard is asking, what is the current state of play for battlefield eye imaging, countermeasures and defenses against countermeasures, for example, in a symmetric conflict between middle ranking powers? Well, this is a very difficult question to answer because it depends on who are the two powers, I suppose. I am assuming that you are asking in general now what is the level of control and uh, data fusion that can be obtained in the modern battlefield well the answer is quite high but still not complete many armies today filled uh, some battlefield management systems which pretty much have a station in almost every vehicle, in almost every command, till the say platoon level. And these systems can uh, track in a semi-automatic way without relying too much on, let's say, written or spoken um, communications. I would say they, they can track the situation of the units on the battlefield and tend to be uh, quite effective. And they tend to be quite reliable because modern data links tend to be quite difficult to jam. They often require quite a large power to be jammed. So they provide a reasonably good and accurate picture of the battlefield to the land commander. Problem is the land commander will have no clue of what's going on in the air and what's going on on the sea if there is any in the vicinity. These kind of systems have been pioneered by navies, obviously, where they're easier to apply and they are even more important, even more crucial because uh, fleets, modern fleets, are integrated. A single ship is hardly used in a high threat environment. Uh, ships complement each other. So actually having communications and control capability deployed is essential. But there are all types of shapes and forms of different links in news. Uh, the NATO has a lot of stand standards. The Russians as well have developed a various type of uh, data link, uh, which are honestly very little known in the West but we know they are very efficient and effective, particularly in uh, the air defense um, sector. So it's becoming increasingly common, but normally there is very uh, little integration between land forces, naval forces and air, uh, and air forces. So we can say that commanders don't have a very good picture of the battlefield, today in the modern environments, but they have three very good pictures of the battlefield. Coming to the second part of your question, I think you mean electronic countermeasures. This is very, very difficult 
to be exhaustive. The reason I have been asked times and again, make a video about electronic countermeasure, make a video about electronic warfare. I haven't done one yet because finding anything above the basic in this field is practically impossible because actually electronic warfare and electron countermeasure and counter countermeasures are basically the most closely guarded secrets uh, in military technology. So yeah, I'm afraid it's very difficult to, to say what's going to happen. The only thing that we can safely say, I believe, is that the interaction of the electronic environments of the different players is gonna have a large uh, part in determining the final outcome of the hostilities, of the, fault of the actual fault of hostilities. This is, by the way, <laughs> a reason why I don't do comparisons, because they make no sense. It's not because a plane is quicker than another or a ship has more missiles than another that is better or, or it makes literally no sense. It is the interaction of all uh, the environment that is around the assets that make an enormous difference. And we don't know anything really meaningful about this kind of interaction. Maybe that one side countermeasure are, are capable of shutting down totally the communications of the other side or maybe that they are totally worthless and they will do nothing. So I'm sorry, I can't really give any answer which is more detailed than this. Anyway, thank you very much for your questions. Final question from the user Rothbard. What is an Hashcat? Okay, this is a very simple question. Thank you for asking me and not Googling it. A hash kit is something that you normally found on civilian aircrafts and not on military. And it is just a profile that is applied downstream on the nozzle of the plane just to reduce the noise. There's nothing more than that. If you just uh, disturb a little bit the boundary of the flow coming out of the um, of the engine uh, yes there is a good reduction in noise on some civilian airplanes you can see that the uh, external ring of the engine you know, the, the trailing edge of the external ring of the engine has some spikes yeah that is that one is the ash kit basically So, thank you very much for your questions, thank you very much for your support, thank you very much if you share, thank you very much if you watch, thank you very much if you subscribed, if you hit the bell, thank you very much for asking a question, thank you very much for, much for liking or disliking or leaving a comment or even insulting me because in a few times it actually happened, but that's fine, we love everybody, peace. Thank you very much for watching this. I really enjoyed actually doing this, so we should do more often. See you next time.